Uh, first of all, welcome to the Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. This collection, as you know, is the, um, the special collection of Lincoln City Libraries. It is an endowment supported collection, so it's not supported by taxpayer funds. It's supported by an endowment created by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, the NLHA. And so we want to thank the NLHA. Our um, NLHA board president, Nick Hernandez, is here, as well as some NLHA members. And so um, just to thank them for um, creating the endowment and for continuing to support it with their member dues and their fundraising efforts and the special programming that they do. So we can thank the NLHA for having us and for, <laughs> and for providing for this collection. Uh, the important functions of this uh, Heritage Room collection are to celebrate and to preserve and to promote the works of Nebraska authors, both past and present. And we do that by collecting books and maintaining vertical files on more than 4,000 Nebraska authors. Um, most of them, well, there are about uh, 14,000 volumes in this collection. There, that's only a representative sample of the collection of uh, books <laughs> produced by Nebraska authors. There's some great literary talent in this state, and we are doing our best to preserve those materials and to, um, to promote them. And one of the ways that we celebrate and promote uh, Nebraska authors is providing, by providing this forum for authors to share their work and um, creating an opportunity for people to hear about the new works being produced by Nebraska authors. So this is uh, the Ames Reading Series, the 213th Ames Reading event. <laughs> We've been going since 1985. The first ever program was uh, Catherine Kidwell in June of 1985 and uh, we have a really proud history of some incredible Nebraska authors um, reading at this event. I'm personally just starstruck today with um, with meeting all of these, um, all of you, I mean authors who are reading today and authors who are in the audience. I, I'm a little bit giddy. <laughs> I'm just standing here in front of you and not feeling very articulate. <laughs> so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we are uh, filming for Five City TV and for our Five City TV video on demand viewers, I'd like to welcome you. The, this is being filmed in the Heritage Room. We're on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library. And we're here during our public service hours on Sunday. Uh, we're open from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Sunday afternoons. And um, so we'd like to welcome our viewers and thank you for tuning in. The authors that we have reading for us today are all authors who are published in a book called A Different Plane, Contemporary Nebraska Fiction Writers. Uh, it's this book right here. It was edited by Ledette Randolph and published in 2004. Um, a Different Plane is, uh, is an exemplary book on its own, but it's also, uh, we're featuring it as one of the Nebraska 150 books. Um, featured books. The Nebraska Sesquicentennial is the 150th celebration of Nebraska statehood and that is being celebrated March 1st, 2017. So in advance of that celebration we chose a number of books that are representative of Nebraska's history and culture and um, are encouraging Nebraskans to read those books to, um, to have a better sense of Nebraska's history and culture. And so the tie that binds these authors together we have uh, first of all Ledette Randolph who edited the book but is also an author as well, and Jonas Agee, uh, Anna Minardo, Timothy Shaffert, and Karen Shoemaker. Um, and they're all published in the book as, and some of their books, their novels are um, also on the Nebraska 150, uh, 150 list. So we encourage you to read some of these books, to pick up some of the literature about the Nebraska sesquicentennial, um, and to really celebrate uh, Nebraska's history through literature. Um, I'm just going to read one uh, brief, um, review of the book before I pass it off to Lydette to introduce the authors. Uh, when the book was published in 2004, there was a glowing review in the Lincoln Journal Star, and I'm just going to read an excerpt from this. It uh, was published on September 26th by Pamela S. Thompson and Peter G. Heckman. Flipping through this anything but plain collection of short stories penned by a vastly various cast of contemporary Nebraska writers was a true late summer reading delight for both of us. University of Nebraska Press executive director or executive editor, Ledette Randolph did a masterful job choosing some very impressive works. In her introduction, Randolph discusses that although more than half of the stories are set in Nebraska, it's not a ne Nebraska, it's, it is not a Nebraska immediately identif identifiable by landscape or cityscape. 
What the widely divergent stories of contemporary life in all its complexities share is a sense of mobility, which from our country's beginning has certainly defined life on the Great Plains. But as Randolph states, the mobility embedded in each story is a restlessness, not a rootlessness. The sense of a place is everywhere. It is as subtle as the landscape itself, she writes. If you'd like to explore the vast landscape of contemporary Nebraska fiction, check out A Different Plane. The imaginative vision and voices of the collected Nebraska writers certainly will expand any reader's literary horizons. Um, I think that's one of the things that I love most about Nebraska authors is that they can capture the sense of Nebraska and really share that with their readers throughout the world. And so all of these authors have done a masterful job of that. So uh, first of all, it, I'll introduce Ledette and then she'll introduce you to the other authors. Ledette is now editor-in-chief of Plowsha Plowshares at Emerson College. She's the author of four books, two novels, Haven's Wake, which is a book that's on our Nebraska 150 list, and a Sand Hills Ballad. She also authored the short story collection, This Is Not the Tropics, and the memoir, Leaving the Pink House. In, a different, in addition to A Different Plane, she is editor of a collection of contemporary Nebraska nonfiction writers. Uh, that book is called The Big Empty, and we do have <laughs> one of the Ames readings, I think 2000, um, 2007, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had an Ames reading uh, featuring, um, featuring this book, The Big Empty, and we do have videos of that if you'd like to see, uh, to see that program. And uh, she's also published stories and essays in numerous literary journals. She is the recipient of four Nebraska Book Awards, among other awards, too many to mention right here, and she's been reprinted in the Best New American Voices. She's co-owner of the manuscript consulting firm, Randolph Lundeen, and she's a longtime Nebraskan. Uh, she spent her childhood here in Nebraska, um, in the part of the west, west central Nebraska, where her family has lived for five generations. But she now lives in Boston with her husband, Noel Eicher, and she came here just for this program. So thank you, Ledette, for coming and for bringing together these authors. It's a pleasure to have you. OK. Thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Sunday. And it's such a treat to be home. I, I have a good life in Boston, but I'm a Nebraskan, and this is still my home. Um, so thank you. Aaron, so much for putting this together. And thank you so much for this wonderful room, Meredith. I know you've played a long time role here. Um, and the uh, Nick is gone, it looks like. Oh, he's taking pictures. <laughs> thank you for your work, too. Um, it's such an honor to be invited back here to the Ames Reading Series. Um, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be here today, uh, in particular on behalf of this book, which is very important to me. Um, this anthology was a labor of love. Um, it started, the idea for it started in 2002. And I won't go into the long backstory, but it was really a kind of effort to communicate to the wider literary community how significant Nebraska writers were, um, and also to communicate to those writers themselves that, so, to, so that they would find one another, that they would we'd create kind of a community. And I think it, it did uh, do a lot of that, what I'd wanted it to. Um, also, the royalties for this book have always gone to benefit the friends of the University of Nebraska Press. I regret that I did not include that in my introduction, but that's always been a, it's always been a benefit for the, the friends. And also, it was made possible with a generous grant from the Nebraska Arts Council. This, this is a very costly thing to reprint this kind of work, and, and that grant made that possible for us. Um, it's been a long time since I've taken a look at this book, I have to admit, 12 years ago. You know, it seems like a long time. So on the plane coming here, I reread the book, and I, I realized um, that it really held up. You know, it's always a little nerve-wracking when you go back and read something. You think, was I really an idiot? I was not an idiot. Um, these are terrific <laughs> stories, and they feel really fresh still. And, and if anything, they, they feel actually more relevant now. Um, so they're really, they don't shirk from anything about contemporary life. They're, they're really great stories. Um, so I'm going to just read a little bit from Mary Pfeiffer's introduction, um, just a couple of paragraphs that I felt like set this up. And then I will introduce our four readers. And um, I will introduce them in advance and then let them just each come up. Is that OK? Um, and I'll, they'll read alphabetically if I can remember to put Timothy second to the last. I keep <laughs> wanting to put him last. Um, let's see, where is that? OK. So this is from Mary Pfeiffer's introduction. The diversity of places and topics makes this collection sparkle. Nebraska voices are not just rural, white, Christian, or heterosexual. 
These authors give us postmodern slices of life and reports from moments and small turnings. They write of the pain of being misunderstood, the difficulties in finding a place, the loss of partners, and the weirdness of adult relationships. A surprising number of the stories explore men struggling to understand a world that overwhelms them with its complexity and nuance. Many of the stories involve pilgrimages, leaving on a quest, or searching for something that's been lost. These stories resonate with each other in their depth of analysis about emotional, social, and moral issues. This is a volume of serious writers engaged in serious work. All of the weighty issues of the world are tackled by this group. Love, choices, work, and forgiveness. The stories are provocative in their intelligence and energy. They unfurl with all the beauty of spring leaves. They manage to be both cutting edge and deeply familiar, as if written by one's closest friends. I invite you to delight in this blossoming, blossoming of world-class writers from Nebraska. So I do urge you to read this if you haven't read it. Our readers, or writers today, because they're writers, um, are continuing to write and are going to be reading new work. So they will not be reading an excerpt from this book. So um, this is an opportunity to hear something really fresh from all of them. So the first of our readers will be, um, and these are, these are very short intros, um, Jonas Agee is the author of 13 books, most recently a novel, The Bones of Paradise. She teaches at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and is a co-publisher with her husband Brent Spencer of Bright Books. Anna Minardo is the author of two novels, Falling in Love with Natasha and Courtyard of Dreams. She teaches at the University of Nebraska at Omaha's Writers' Workshop and has won many awards. And I can't name all of the, you know, I can't do all of these uh, bios justice. Um, Timothy Shaffert is the author of five books, most recently the novel Swan Gondola. He teaches at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and tells me he has just finished a new novel about Hollywood in the 1920s, and I think he's reading from part of that. And Karen Gethardt Shoemaker is the author of The Meaning of Names and the short story collection Night Sounds and Other Stories. She is the faculty mentor at the University of Nebraska's MFA in the writing program. And she's won Nebraska, won book one Nebraska, The Meaning of Names. So you all know her, I'm sure, very well. So welcome, all of you, and thank you for all for coming. Thank you. It's great to see everybody. And thank you for Aaron for inviting us. And thank you, Ledette, for including me in the, uh, the wonderful anthology and for keeping it alive. That's so lovely. I'm going to be reading from um, my new novel, The Bones of Paradise, which is set in the Nebraska Sand Hills and on the Rosebud and Pine Ridge Reservations. And they're set, it's set in 1900 with sections of it going back to 1892, the massacre at Wounded Knee on Pine Ridge Reservation. So. Uh, What's happened, I'm, I'm, this is the moment when Dulcinea Bennett and Rose at Dawn come home for the first time after being away for a long time. And uh, just before this, she, Dulcinea has gotten news that her husband, JB, has been killed. And Rose has gotten news that her sister was killed with him, and no one knows why. Dulcinea and Rose stopped their horses on the last hill overlooking the ranch and stepped down to stretch their legs after the long ride. Yesterday, they left Rosebud, crossed into Nebraska, and stopped in Babylon for the night before coming into the hills. It was the end of the day, and Dulcinea could see lone cowboys on horseback driving cattle slowly out to summer pastures. They must be late this year because of J.B.'s. She could not say the word yet. Glancing at Rose, she felt the kinship of sorrow and could not begin to imagine the loss of a sister. There, were no, there was no hierarchy to grief, she realized, and her knees nearly buckled at her feet as she sank into the sand underfoot, where the horse and wagon traffic had killed the grass. She was almost home, and something made her pause. To the right was a vast blue lake, the surrounding marsh alive with birds feeding and mating. The air bore the moist scent of water, so blue it put the distant white-blue sky to shame. She shaded her eyes to stare at the lake where pelicans floated peacefully. Nearby, a pair of swans stretched their long necks, searching the waters for food, and farther on, ducks dove and flapped, green necks glistening in the sun. Myriad red-winged blackbirds perched on dried cattail stalks with brown heads shedding into the new green shoots below. Nearby, one bird straddled two cattails, feet clenched fiercely to hold its territory against the loud hissing wind. 
After she rode down this hill, nothing would ever be the same. Right now, Dulcinea was between two worlds, but soon she would be in the one without her husband. She stuck her hand in the pocket of her traveling coat, fingered the crumpled yellow paper that carried JB's last coded message from March. Soon the birds take wing with my heart. She hadn't known about his poetic nature when they first married or even after the boys were born. It took their separation for his silence to become eloquent in the anonymity of the telegraph's compressed language. She fingered the paper's edge. She was wearing its softest flannel. Beyond the lake, the hills rode green and humped like ancient fallen beasts, their grass remorseless and brutal hair. There were few trees that thrived naturally here. The occasional cedar the men hacked down because it drew too much water, the sand willows, mulberries, wild cherry, and cottonwood by the small creeks and rivers. She used to miss trees terribly, their casual interruption of the sky, until she returned to Chicago for a visit. Then she missed th these ragged hills instead. She stooped to pick a, pink, a wild pink rose, avoiding the tiny spines that slivered like unseen glass hairs into one's fingers. There was little scent, but the creamy softness of the petals, like the inside of a dog's ear, more than made up for it. She placed one on her tongue and imagined she could taste the hills, the bittersweet tang of life. Those three men don't have any cattle. Roy's rose pointed east where the cowboys trotted their horses. Two of the men slumped in the saddle while the third rode with shoulders high and firm. Where did it happen? Dulcinea asked. Rose would know. She's already been out there. Rose tipped her head at the three men. That way, water tank between Bennett lands. Why was my husband there with your sister? How old was she? Dulcinea regretted her question the moment it left her mouth, and Rose grimaced like she'd been slapped. I'm sorry. Dulcinea reached out, placed her hand on Rose's arm. I don't understand. I don't either, Rose admitted. She was going to meet a man who could help her. She paused and picked up the reins. She dropped to ground tie her horse. She was a good girl, told me he had information about her mother. She appeared lost in thought as she watched the three men near the ranch yard. Maybe it wasn't your husband she was meeting. Dulcinea stared at the other woman, who bit her lower lip to stop from saying more. She stepped back and picked up her own reins, then pretended to check the cinch on the saddle before she mounted again. What could J.B. know about Rose's family? She'd told him about befriending Rose when they met in March, and he seemed ignorant of their family. She looked westward, where heavy clouds lay above a gray veil that meant someone was getting the luck and the rain. The sun hung near the lip of the horizon like a red ball at rest, and a low bush beside her suddenly exploded with lavender butterflies that clou crowded, clouded around her long skirt, washed up her bodice, and splashed against her face, their wings like an exhaled breath of powder as she closed her eyes. Something about the moment, its unexpected tenderness, made her long to hear him say her name again just once more. Dulcinea, Dulce May as he'd whispered in her ear when they'd met last in March. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Erin, for hosting us. Lydette, I'm grateful to be included today. And I'm, I'm grateful to be a Nebraska writer for 19 years now. It's hard to believe. Um, I'm reading from a recently completed memoir. It's the story of my family's uh, immigration to the U.S. from southern Italy before and just after World War II. Specifically, the memoir looks at two arranged marriages. My maternal grandparents and my parents, both marriages were arranged to facilitate immigration. The title of the memoir is After Italy. I could dig in anywhere, 1920, 1950, 2016. I could begin in Italy, Pittsburgh, New York, or Nebraska, begin with my parents, my grandparents, or me. And from every point of entry, our story is the same, three generations unhappy in love. It's 1929, or anno settesimo on the fascist calendar marking seven years after the rise of Mussolini. My family's village in the mountains of southern Italy, I'll call it Villaggio, a pretty 14-year-old. Her mother tells her a man has asked to marry her. The girl says no. 
He's a stranger, some guy who's been to America and come back with a little money looking for a wife. He's almost 28, and he wants her. No. But the girl's mother tells her, marry him. He'll take you to America. In time, the young girl and the older man, Stella and Giuseppe, will become my, go my grandparents. <coughs> But they are still basically strangers to each other on their wedding day. For young Stella, this ceremony does have the feel of a too hastily moving forward dream. And her anxiety will never completely dissipate during the f 52 years they will be married. A few days before the wedding, Stella's brothers walk the nine miles to the city to purchase her wedding accessories, but they come back with two unmatched white high heel shoes. <laughs> Years later, she will tell me, that's how we started out, on the wrong foot, for sure. <laughs> Jumping now forward several decades to my late 30s, I was living in New York. I had a longtime boyfriend. I call him Sam here. Um, at one point, we were engaged for 14 days. Um, the, the relationship ended, and then not long afterward, my father died. So this section I'm going to read picks up at around that time with an Italian phrase. Quando buono non c'è. Grandma Stella used to say in our Calabrian dialect, Utriste vala. This meant, when happiness isn't possible, sadness will have to do. Two years after Sam and I parted with nothing left to lose and hoping to have a child, I did marry. Just like my mother and her mother, I had a marriage of convenience. Except I found the guy myself and negotiated on my own behalf. I'd met him in April when he was a visiting poet at the university where I taught fiction. The poet was recovering from his divorce and, and we, made each other ha we made each other laugh, which in lieu of deep love, seemed as good a place as any to latch on. A few hours before our September 1st wedding, which would take place in the poet's house in Arkansas, I found myself in his backyard, stepping my bare feet into a puddle of mud. My hair was damp from the shower, and I was already in my wedding clothes. A flowered 1940s shirtwaist dress I'd bought two days earlier in a vintage shop for $18. None of the standard white frou-frou for me. Determined to outwit the marriage demons, I was stripping away everything but the most basic rites. Rather than in church, our ceremony would take place in the tiny room with tall windows that had recently become my writing room. The poet had declared the pretty room mine three weeks earlier when I'd arrived for a visit. His enthusiasm for our relationship seemed unfettered. And so, in the tradition of the arranged marriage, I assumed the role of the pliable bride, which actually felt a little bit nice, something like falling back onto a feather bed, ignoring that I might sink too deeply to ever crawl out. Until the day of the ceremony, when I was suddenly alone in the house while the poet ran to the grocery for flowers, and I became short of breath. I couldn't stand still with this thing I was about to do. So I stepped into the backyard. Maybe I'd clip a geranium or cut a tomato off the vine. But then I spotted that mud puddle the sprinkler had left in the dirt, and suddenly, Gripped by some primal arousal, <laughs> I unbuckled my black strappy sandals and sank my bare feet into the mud of rural Arkansas. I'm a peasant. <laughs> over and over, my feet lifted and plunged in, insisting on knowing that wet earth, which was as warm as heated towels. I'm getting married, I thought, and this is my peasant pedicure. <laughs> Eventually, my heartbeat settled and I started laughing, as I would have if a troop of bridesmaids had been with me. 
And then my closest friends and cousins did surround me. I could almost see them. An impromptu wedding, I imagined them saying, this is perfect for you. I was still laughing. When off to the side, the grandmothers appeared, bent old village women dressed in their sour black, a few with missing teeth, their twisted braids thinned into code di lucertole, lizard's tails. If there was a thimble full of youth left in those women, it was in their eyes which mocked me. Silly girl, you think marriage and men can change life into a fairy tale? We were just like you. And now, look. I did not look didn't listen. And if I had, would the poet and I have been spared what unfolded for us? Three miscarriages, umpteen breakups, and reunions. Losing my page here. Even reconciliation, twice after divorce. Those ancient women were powerless to divert me on my wedding day. Still, they didn't leave without warning me. Bella, you can be married or not, but love will have its way with you in ways you can only glimpse while you stand there sunk up to your ankles in the muck. Not long after, with my feet rinsed and dried and my sandals buckled back on, I opened the front door and hugged our handful of wedding guests. The justice of the peace was mustachioed and white-suited and as affable as Mark Twain. By that evening, when we all went out to dinner, a man who was practically a stranger was my husband, and I was his third wife. Five years we were together. Thank you. Um, so uh, I wanted to mention too that Jonas is actually going to read more from The Bones of Paradise and discuss her book on Wednesday at 3.30 at the Great Plains Art Gallery. So I hope you can make it to that as well. Um, yeah, so I just, I think I finished a book. Um, <laughs> one never knows those things. But, um, and so I think this is the beginning of it. But again, one never knows. Um, it's a book called Savoy, S-A-V-O-Y, which is the character's uh, a name. And um, this first chapter begins in Hollywood, 1924. Uh, at the center of a buffet table was a replica of the Titanic carved from a block of ice. It sat in the sunset, poolside, dripping its sweat into a sea of broiled prawns. Cocktail waitresses, short-haired flappers wearing nothing but hip-length life vests of canvas and cork, carried toy boats as serving trays, offering hors d'oeuvres of roasted eel. Guests were invited to swim, but the pool was kept frigid. To brave its icy waters, you had to fortify yourself with shots of whiskey. Many did when the sun went down. They dove in naked, and they whooped and shrieked. We were soon to begin production on The Song of the Titanic, and so a party. A columnist for Photo Fun magazine asked me why. Why sink the Titanic, I said. She wisely waited until late in the evening to approach me. All the martinis and the back slapping had gone to my head. And I was happy, happier perhaps than ever. Of course, I wouldn't tell her the truth, that the song of the Titanic began as a hook to catch an old lover and that it worked. It was my valentine to Bertie, my forbidden love. Instead, I told her the movie was all about me. It's a metaphor that suits me, I said. Like Captain Smith of the Titanic, I've had to navigate through treacherous waters to get where I got. Now I ask you, what kind of knucklehead compares his career to Captain Smith's? <laughs> but I was somewhat convinced at that particular point in time that mortality didn't pertain, pertain to me anymore. I'd outgrown it. My childhood had been mostly fatal, but I'd nonetheless become indestructible. I could waltz off the roof of a building and land on my feet. I could tango off the end of a pier and never drown or break my neck. In my every movie, my every dance became more and more complicated, 
graceful missteps, elegant stunts, but there was always someone or something to catch me. I was worth too much to lose. When I was a kid, I'd gone to bed every night hoping to wake up with beautiful, horrible, terrifying, merciful, magical powers. I halfway thought my wish came true in Hollywood. At my most famous, I was the most famous man in the world. They named dance steps after me, cocktails, candy, cuts of diamonds, bars of soap, gin-scented hair tonic. Young men mimicked the way I wore my tie crooked, and they spent hours in the mirror practicing my careless half-smile. There's a little scar at my lip from my rough-and-tumble childhood, and they even copied that. A few teen delinquents in Berlin gouged into their own flesh so my scar would mark their lips, too. Remember that Hester Klang song that was so popular we all got sick of it? My handsome man has Savoir Fair, Savoy's scar, and Samson's hair. <laughs> Everyone wanted me to have everything I ever wanted. They said so, in all their millions of love letters to me. The studio, as a stunt, put a giant electric ticker on the tallest sign in Times Square, claiming to keep count of every heart I broke. Every day felt like a victory. Whole armies of men outlived. And then... Along came the song of the Titanic. With my movie, I was certain I would change the course of that legendary ship. It would no longer be a metaphor for hazard and catastrophe. I would resurrect the disaster, and the name Titanic would again mean grand extravagance and spectacle. I had my reasons. That photo fun colonist, a woman named Delight St. John, would make quite a success for herself from my failure. After everything went wrong, I confined myself to my house. I refused all invitations. I settled no curiosities. Delight St. John, meanwhile, spent 50 years telling my story as she saw it. She published three best-selling unauthorized biographies about me, Savoy, the Manhattan Dandy from Omaha, The Loves and Scandals of Hayes Savoy, and Death on Savoy's Titanic. Until I threatened to sue, she billed herself as Hayes Savoy's longtime confidant when giving interviews and lectures. My threat just made her more infamous. She peddled herself then as Hayes Savoy's worst enemy. <laughs> Even after most of my films had long been lost or turned to smoke, after my silent movies had been forgotten, she kept me alive as a symbol of excess and indulgence. My downfall caused the downfall of the Roaring Twenties to hear her tell it. While I'd once been the man who had everything, I ended up the man who ruined it for everyone else. <laughs> Delight St. John never knew anything at all about me. She patched those biographies together from old magazine articles and gossip from strangers. She also relied heavily on a series of books for young men. They were credited to me, but they were ghostwritten by someone I never met. Savoy's Guide to Flapping a Flapper. Savoy's Guide to Nifty Necking. Savoy's Guide to Dressing Snappy and Dancing Happy. <laughs> Savoy's Guide to Useful Nonsense. You couldn't talk about her without talking about me. And though I no longer felt like being talked about, I was tickled to squat on so many column inches of her obituary. And her death couldn't have been more apropos if I'd composed it myself. In 1979, at the age of 74, she was traveling alone on a cruise ship. Feeling a little green around the grill, gills, she retired to her cabin for dinner, then privately choked to death on a teensy-weensy fishbone. The poor old gal should have seen that extended metaphor coming from a mile away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Lydette, for putting this together. And I am with Aaron on this. This is really um, intimidating to, to be in this lineup and to be with you guys. And um, it's appropriate that I always come in Tim's shadow. I've been following him around since we both started writing only. <laughs> but um, I, had, I am with several of my heroes here. I'm going to be reading something from... Um, when people ask me, what are you working on now? Uh, it's uh, allegedly this. <laughs> it's called The Last Living Waitress of the Home Cafe. <laughs> and it's, um, this, it's a mother-daughter story. In this section, there are actually, um, there's a mother, a daughter, and a granddaughter. But the um, main characters of the book are Marie, who you will be hearing her talk about it, and her daughter, Maggie. The, um, 
catch is that Marie is telling her story from the other side of the grave. So she's dead. And this is, the, this is in the scene where you are first introduced to her. And she um, comes back at a time when her daughter, Maggie, has sat down in the middle of a road ready to um, let someone run over her. So it's at a critical point. Um, her shoulder blades stand out sharp as wings beneath the cotton of her summer shirt, and that is how I know it is her. She is the hot core at the center of me, of what is left of me. The pulse and bone of her pull me up and out of the miasma of this place I can neither leave nor inhabit. I feel her rather than see her. There is a sacredness to the spot where the soul leaves its earthly body. Only the awake can feel it. To be sacred is to be untouchable, to be alone, to be left waiting for ritual or recognition. My words come back before I do. First there is this. Oh, my darling, it's you. It is you. And then I am me. I am barefoot on asphalt that hold, still holds the heat of the daytime sun. The night wind lifts my long hair from the back of my neck and cools the sweat there. I lift my arms above my head, the better to gulp the air, the hay-sweetened, plum-blossomed, living air. Dizzy with wild sensations I could call joy, but tr that truly have no name, I sway on that road where I last drew breath, and I want to laugh. I want to cry. I want to run just to feel the muscles in these legs, my legs. And I want to sit down and wrap my arms around my baby, my little girl, Maggie, Maggie, my Maggie. But there is no time. That is the cruel joke of all this. Time is supposed to keep everything from happening all at once, but released from this life, where that may or may not be true, into the next, where time does not even exist, everything is always. I take my last breath and my first in one inhalation, and I reach down to touch the wings of my Maggie, just as I look down at my own hands to tell the story of fire and the moment that is coming at her is the moment that came at me and there are headlights in the darkness coming toward my little broken girl who looks up but does not flinch, does not move and the lights are coming. I put my hand up to save her but I am not here. I am forever gone. My mother married when she was 18 years old and pregnant with me. She had already been accepted into university. She was on her way to somewhere else when her life happened. My father, a neighbor boy in the Meadow Lane, where they grew, both grew up, went on to get his degree in finance while she stayed home with a baby, with me. He went away for a time to be a soldier and then he came home to a job in insurance, the bank downtown. My mother wanted to be a country club member and they were invited to join because of my father's job. Mother never fit in, but she would not relinquish the membership. She was angry all the time, a hungry secret drunk who would give up necessities for show things, a new car each year in exchange for heat in the house each winter, for example. She had a way of watching me when she thought I wasn't aware, evaluating me, testing to see if I measured up to some unknown standard she held close to her chest. Her eyes could see more in a glance than my father could see in hours of study. When I told her I was pregnant, I started with saying, I'm sorry. And I ended with saying, I'm sorry. And I said, not much in between. I remember she was standing by the sink with her back to me, and she kept it that way for a long spell. When she turned around, her left eyebrow was raised, and she had a small, thin smile on her face. It was the face of her deepest anger. She kept it focused on me until I said, I'm sorry again. When she spoke, her lips barely moved. Why are you sorry? It takes two to make three. Not what I expected, but she had a way of giving that felt like taking, so I simply stared at the headlights of her anger and waited. That's still true, isn't it, Marie? That's how it works, right? She tightened her smile. Her eyebrows leveled out and she crossed her arms. Marie, I trust you know enough about the birds and the bees to know how this happened. We discussed this. I sat you down on that sofa right there and I told you about this, about keeping your legs crossed. Did I not? I told you about boys. I told you about your body. I told you about their bodies and their ways and I told you not to be stupid. 
I looked at the sofa she pointed toward, the only one in the house, and stared at what must have appeared spa- stared with what must have appeared to be a bovine expression. <laughs> No, she did not set me down on that couch and tell me about boys. No, she did not tell me about sex. I squinted at that sofa because I could not squint at her. Marie, I sat you down the morning you started your first period and I told you everything you needed to know to avoid this very thing. You were wearing the blue pinafore I made you and had on white knee socks. You sat there, she pointed at the end closest the door, and I sat here, you were wearing blue. I looked at her and then back at the sofa. Mom, you never made a pinafore for me. (laughs) She slapped my face so hard and fast I didn't even see her move across the room. So you're a slut and a liar. She was standing by the sink again, her arms crossed under her breasts, elbows grasped, grasped tightly in opposite hands. She could hold herself that way for hours. I remember that. Do you know the sire? Mom, she could always surprise me, I'll say that much. It's Mark, of course I know. He's my boyfriend. Is there a weaker sounding word in a situation like this than boyfriend? (laughs) Even in the moment it made me flinch. She didn't miss a thing. So your boyfriend is going to be a daddy. Does he know that? Or is it this just a special secret you and I share? You think I'm going to help you get rid of it? You want to be a murderer, too. I don't know what is wrong with you. I did my best. Every day, I gave you my best. I cooked for you and cleaned for you and took you to dance classes and music lessons and let your little friends stay here so I could clean up after them, too. I let them into my home for you. And now this. You want me to clean this up for you, too. She was talking so fast now I couldn't get any words into a gap. She listed everything she'd ever done like a bizarrely detailed resume. Every breath she had ever taken had been from me, from the time I was born to this moment, and I stood in her kitchen and ruined her life. Again. She got louder with each sentence until she was screaming. She didn't uncup her elbows, so all this poison poured out of her tall, stiff frame with only her lips moving. The force of it pushed me back until the doorknob hit my hip and I reached around to grab it. She stopped when she saw me do that, and the house went coldly silent. We stared at one another for a long time. Get out. Don't come back. My life, you see did not prepare me for love. Perhaps that is why death has brought me back.